Good afternoon, everybody. I think we are online, and this is particularly important because I know we are really many also online, and I welcome you no matter where you are, in what part of Europe or God knows even the world. I definitely welcome very much all the people here in the room. It's a great experience to be not against a screen, but really in a room with real people. So. Welcome to the uh, Presidency Conference of uh, Estonia and the Observatory. You know, the Observatory is a part of the Council of Europe that every year has a rotating presidency with one of its members. And this year it's Estonia who um, gives us the pleasure to, in a way, head the Observatory. And therefore, it's also my particular pleasure to immediately make space for the Under Secretary for the Arts, Mr. Daniel Rotsepp, in order to address you. Please. Thank you. It's uh, great to be here. It was 2019 in Cannes when uh, Susan Nikolchev and uh, our former minister, Denis Lukas, agreed on. Uh, hosting the presidency in Estonia, and it's now 2022, and we are opening the conference. It's a great honor to Estonia uh, to host the conference. We, too, in Estonia firmly believe that uh, cultural policy should be based, on, based more on data and little less on emotion. <laughs> and uh, in this regard, I think uh, the observatory is doing a marvelous job and something we are following throughout and seeing as exemplary. Thank you for that. We are doubly honored because this year's conference is focusing on the creatives. This is a trend lately, I would say, that we are focusing more and more on creatives. Maybe it's due to the pandemic, but I welcome this, and we welcome this trend wholeheartedly. And in the stone of film industry, we have always seen that the creative is the key. The creatives have the key to the great movies, to great culture. So thank you for that. Estonia loves its cinema. We love the European films. We are avid cinema goers, and so it's triply great to host you. So thank you. And I hope you do enjoy Tallinn. Uh, you have some opportunity to see the city and the country. Enjoy it. Thanks. So indeed, as has been said, we are focusing today on creators in European screen sector. And it is thanks, I should say, to a very special person of, to the observatory, Edith Sepp, this year's uh, president of the executive council, the governing board of the observatory. But of course, I think, uh, at least as much and better known as the Estonian Film Institute CEO and also a long year board member with the efforts. And um, as often when we go to, to countries as observatory, we also want to learn something about the country. And in this case, I think we could not have anybody, anybody better <laughs> than edit. Uh, to really lead us a little bit into this world of the creators by coming to the floor and giving the keynote. Thank you, Thank you Susan, for kind words. Tere päevas kõigile meie külalistele, tere tulemast Tallinna, tere tulemast Eestisse. Bon après-midi tout le monde. Bienvenue à Tallinn, bienvenue à Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Tallinn. Welcome to Estonia, to those physically and also to those joining us online. Let me start with a bold statement, since Estonians wants to be bold these days. The future is ours to create. The future is not something that happens at some distant point. We are part of our future and we must create it. We must be architects of our own destiny. The conference today is not only about the challenges of our industry, 
It is also about the immense opportunities that lie ahead of us. Today, as we celebrate 30 years of the European Audiovisual Observatory, one of the main questions in our screen industries is how we will tell our European stories in a visual language in 30 years to come, which needs a global and long-term perspective. The same was mentioned by the European Film Agency Director's vision paper for 2030. The efforts government agencies that deliver 3 billion euros of subsidies every single year. One of my key messages today is this. We must encourage our creators to use all kinds of digital media to do their stories, so that the storytelling embraces different forms of ever-changing digital world and is not stuck in the past. Why? The main reason is simple. Tomorrow's culture is the culture of the next generation and we have a responsibility in, on, in front of our children to have a vision. Our children live in a digital world and, need to be, and we need to be relevant to them. We need to engage today with tomorrow's audiences. Our industry experiences massive changes because of the digital and green change, but also health crisis, power struggles and the war. It all shapes on us and it shapes our future. We are at the crossroads following the pandemic. We can stay still and do nothing, but we can be game changers and in charge. Over the last decade, artificial intelligence in the form of algorithms has transformed both how and what people watch through the power of recommendation engines. With many, many benefits for sure, but not always for the better for true cultural diversity. We have been reminded once more that quantity is most certainty, not another form of quality. However, we are not at the stage and shall never be where computers make films and other computers go to see them. Human creativity remains the beating heart of our industry. It seems to me, and I was a filmmaker before I became a bureaucrat, that during this talk of blockchain, metaverse, web 3.0, we are sometimes in danger for forgetting this basic truth about the creators and forgetting that technology, crucial through it might be, is the means, not the end. Creators, not algorithms, must shape the future of our audiovisual culture in Europe. Here in Estonia, this land of digital unicorns, we understand very well that technology is only as good as human creativity behind it. One of my favorite screenwriters, Jean-Claude Carrière, reminds of this in his book, Le Film qu'on ne voit pas, published exactly 30 years ago at the dawn of the internet. And Carrière has this to say, camera is an art on the move, horrid art. And this sometimes leads filmmakers to see profound change in new equipment, satellite broadcasting, electronic imaging, we we mistake the outward sign of change for the underlying essence of film. Dazzled by technical progress, we believe we are looking, but we delude ourselves. Having too much to see, our eyes often no longer see at all. Carrier also reminded us that the language of moving image can change extremely fast. So that in these days before the cinema, newly released prisoners who had not seen the film for a decade had difficulties following new stories. The narrative simply moved too fast for them. Indeed, some of us might struggle with the speed of TikTok and Snapchat, even though we have not been locked up for 10 years. Let me now turn back to Estonia, the privilege offered by hosting AAO presidency in 2022. Today we celebrate 110 years of filmmaking in Estonia and our Film Institute turned 25 this May. For the quarter of the century now, the Estonian Film Institute has been supporting film creation and filmmakers. 
allowing them to show their talent locally, but also internationally. For a quarter of the century, we just uh, completed an Estonian Republic 100 program, what allowed our directors to truly fulfill their creative aspirations. As one of our documentary directors, Josep Matthias, the director of the film Land Card by the Wind, said, while making this film, I felt that I was truly useful to my country and that my commitment to the nature film genre has practical benefits. To create a film that celebrates the richness and vitality of Estonian nature. The Estonian Republic 100 film program gave me the opportunity to, to create a film that I had long dreamed of making. Here in Estonia, known to the world as a leading high-tech and startup-led society, we are talking some bold initiatives. Only last week, the Minister of Culture hired an advisor who will map up the situation of the digital culture in Estonia, an extremely welcome development. For too long, it has been our understanding that somehow the digital world does not include digital culture, Film, television, audiovisual creation, even games are not recognized as being the heart of the digital world the same way as IT is. When we invest in film and audiovisual, we are actually investing in our creativity, our own stories. We are making an investment in our very identity as a nation and as Europeans. Above all, when we speak about the value of investment in the screen sectors, we need to speak about the filmmakers. We need to talk about the most valuable asset we have, especially in small countries, our people and our talent. After all, this is our creators who, in the word of the director John Borman, turn money into light. So please, let's not lose sight of the bigger picture in Europe, especially since we invented and created that magnificent form of st storytelling we still call the cinema. An invention that made possible everything that came afterwards from talking pictures to TikTok. We should really turn the table around in these difficult times. Let's talk about art of creation, how it shapes our collective future. That is why at the presidency of the EAO, Estonia chose, together with Susanna and her team, to focus on creators. And finally, at this conference today and beyond, let's take to heart these words of the great director, Luis Buñuel, speaking in 1953. Film is a magnificent and dangerous weapon if it is wielded by a free mind. It is the finest instrument we know for expressing the word of dreams, of feeling, of instinct. Thank you. Merci. Aita. Thank you, Edith, for these really philosophical insights. In the world, um, I think, of film, maybe also of your career and how you wanted and did shape the industry of film in Estonia, and of reminding us that actually it's really high time that we look at what is creation and uh, how does the sector deal with that in the new setting. It's high time definitely for the observatory as well. And I have to say it's a little bit new territory for us. So uh, we are here also to learn. And um, that might be the birthday present that you give to us, <laughs> because indeed uh, the observatory turns 30 years this year. And it is, uh, it's the first time we are really focusing on creative sectors. So our gift back to you and the Film Institute is that we're finally doing it. Now, how are we going to look at uh, the creative part? We will do so in the principal structure of two panels. For both, we will have an introduction by the observatory with data or ideas or 
a little bit of um, analytical wisdom that we can already at this early point of our dealing with this new field uh, inject. And then the first panel will be moderated by Edit. It does uh, really focus on first-hand experience, how creative forces themselves, I think, live through these times. And the second one is more meant to discuss the institutional side and, in a way, the policy and political struggles behind. And uh, this I will moderate myself. And there, to the second part, we also want to invite the audience to participate. We have a chat box for everyone who is online. And since this is the majority of our audience, I would really uh, want to encourage you to use this tool. And um, with this, I think we should not lose more time. And I can introduce to you Gilles Fontaine, who is the head of the Department for Market Information and who walks you a little bit through our findings and our questions that are raised this way um, concerning creative, well, forces, workers, industries. Gilles, please. Good afternoon. Um, the point of this uh, presentation is um, basically to open a discussion on the following key questions. Do the massive changes uh, in the audio audiovisual sector uh, that we are experiencing have impacted, are impacting, or will impact the creators? In the course of this presentation, I will share some uh, data that we have started to collect at the observatory about um, directing and writing of films and TV fiction since 2015. And I will try to put them in perspective uh, with what we see in the, in the market. Uh, this data relate to um, EU27 plus the UK. That's what we are able to cover right now in terms of uh, of perimeter. And I have chosen five specific topics, or I would say rather five questions I am asking uh, to myself uh, in, that, uh, in that regard. The first point I would like to, to tackle is, as you know, we sometimes hear about a golden age of the production of uh, content. Um, it is true that um, the production of feature films uh, rebounded significantly in 2021 and resumed with growth. It's about the same for TV fiction. And I sometimes even hear that there is a shortage of talents. And I am asking myself if there is really a shortage of talent. So to try to put some uh, flesh in the discussion, I simply looked at what happened to the <coughs> directors of live action films who directed a film in 2015. And I tried to see what happened to this director later on. And <coughs> I would say the results are to some extent worrisome um, because um, um, out of 100 directors who directed a live action fiction in 2015, only 36 uh, directed at least another films. Some of them also did not direct uh, any other films but moved to TV fiction. Some directors moved to um, writing. But still, at least in our figures, about half of the directors do not show anymore. I did the same analysis for the fiction film writers, and the results are pretty much similar. About half of the writers of a European film in 2015 were not active anymore in the following year. So I'm wondering what's happening here. Probably the figures are not totally right. Probably directors and writers, for example, worked on projects who didn't come through. And these are not in our figures because we only track films which have been actually uh, released. So probably some of them uh, were indeed active, but simply not in the figure. I'm not sure it's changing the order of magnitude of the figures uh, still anyway. So I'm wondering again, what's happening uh, here? Where are 
these creators gone? Are, are they fully out of the sector? Did they move to some kind of digital activity, which is not exactly film or TV fiction? I don't know. Still, I have the feeling of a, some kind of vanishing or some kind of waste. And I'm really wondering, is it um, an industry? Is it an art where accumulating experience doesn't matter that much? And can we afford to have this kind of waste or this kind of vanishing? So that was my first point. As you've seen, uh, it was true, uh, it is true for directors and for writers. Some of these directors and writers moved from film to TV series. But I wanted to have a better order of uh, understanding of this. And I'm wondering myself, TV fiction, is it a new opportunity for film creators or is it just a cliche? So again, I looked at the full list of film directors and the full list of TV fiction uh, directors, both directors and writers, between 2015 and 2020, and I tried to see if the list was overlapping. It is not overlapping, or not very much. Only 11% of directors and 7% of writers worked both for films and TV between 2015 and 2020. That's not that much, and that not fully confirmed the cliché uh, I, was, um, I was mentioning. So I'm doing an hypothesis here. My hypothesis is that probably the production companies which were active in films have diversified to TV fiction. But I'm not sure that they have diversified together with the films and the right, with the directors and the writers which were active in films. And the second question, and I'm asking um, to myself, um, is it different to work for film or to TV fiction? Does it require different uh, skills? Just one minute, I need a glass of water, sorry. <laughs> And this glass of water leads me to my third point, <clears throat> which is still around the idea that maybe TV series is changing the way that creators are, are, are working, that maybe we are moving from a film model to a TV series model. But first, thi first thing first, I wanted to put some figures under, let's say, the film d'auteur classical model, you know, the, the, the model where one creator is credited both as the writer and the director of the film. And the figures tend to show that indeed, in Europe, this model is kind of prevalent. Uh, for 60% of the films which have been directed in Europe between 2015 and, 20, and 2020, over 60% of these films <coughs> we have a creator which is credited both as a writer and, and, um, and, and a director. And <clears throat> also, on the film side, we see that if you exclude these writers and uh, these creators, which are both writers and creators, and directors, sorry, we have only one writer per film. The situation seems different as regards TV fiction. And I have looked to what could be considered as the closest to film. I have looked to uh, uh, high-end TV series. And here, instead of 60%, we have only 20% of all episodes of um, short TV series which have been produced since 2015, where um, only 20% where the same creator is credited as a director and as a writer. And what we have seen also, is that the average number of writers per episode of such series is much higher. It's about three writers per, uh, per episode. So my question here is, are we moving toward more uh, multiple creators creative team in terms of writers? And also, are we seeing here 
some kind of adaptation to the proper European situation of the very US concept of show writers. Is this going to happen uh, in the writing of a TV series? Let's move now to my uh, fourth uh, point, which I have called the more international environment. Um, <clears throat> the rationale be behind this question is, it's a motto of the industry, of the European Commission, of everyone, to favor, to increase the circulation of European films throughout Europe. And one of the tools which is uh, often mentioned are uh, co-production. Co-productions, just to size the phenomenon, it's about 20% of all European films which are produced each year in Europe. It varies between 20 and 25. It's kind of lower regarding uh, high-end TV series episodes where we are in the range of, um, of 12%. Then, <clears throat> for films, I tried uh, to compare the average number of writers for 100% national films and co-production. And maybe I was a little bit naive because I was expecting that the figures would be different. Probably naive, again. I was uh, thinking that maybe for an international co-production, you would mean more input for writers from different countries participating in the co-production in order to introduce more sensitivity maybe to the different countries and culture participating. Again, probably I was naive because that's not what I found in the figures. The typical co-production seems to work like a 100% film with one writer working and probably trying to address a different cultural uh, uh, background of the different countries uh, participating in it. But again, maybe I was naive. And my final point is about, <clears throat> of course, I had to uh, pronounce the word subscription VOD at least once during this presentation. So it's working with SVOD. And first, I had a look at the number of films produced by global streamers, and in particular in Europe, just to share an order of magnitude, it's about 60 films um, a, a year. And I think it is interesting to put them in perspective, <laughs> these 60 films, to put them in perspective with the over 1,100 films which are produced each year in, in EU27 and 2021, and of course, I do not need to comment on the fact that it's hardly um, a scenario that the Netflix and the like will compensate <laughs> and, and become a full substitute to the production of uh, theatrical films. But I thought also it was interesting to put them in, in, in uh, perspective with TV films, TV movies. Because, and that's my question uh, for that last point, um, a lot of debates are going on whether these films produced by Netflix, Disney, and Amazon should be released theatrically. But I have my doubts about that. Because when we are talking of Netflix films as a whole, what are we talking about exactly? Are we talking, we are talking probably to a mix of films which are produced. Um, probably to the standard of theatrical films, but also of other films, which in my view might, might be much closer to what we have called TV films or direct to VOD films or direct to video films, a very whole phenomenon. So here my question is, what does it mean to work for SVOD films? Is it comparable than to work for theatrical films? in many aspects, time, budget, working condition, and so on. So what are really, in the end, these SVOD films? And with this, I, um, I am concluding. 
most of these films and most of these figures and additional figures will be included in a small report that we will publish immediately after the conference and which gather the data that we are now working on at the observatory. Thank you, and I look forward to see if this question, to some extent, can get some answers from the panel. Edith, the floor is yours. You. Oh. Answer then. <laughs> yes, please. Oh, sorry. Well, the first panel should move up. Yes, please. <laughs> and I just wanted to use the occasion to tell you uh, where you find the material then in the future www.obs.coe.int. And I think okay, we have preached the minute well, and I can leave the next round to the panel. Well, thank you, Susanna. And uh, we start to answer the, the questions what Jill put in front of us uh, from one to four. But um, before we start, just uh, maybe we remind you know who is in the panel today. And uh, we just do this kind of short introduction and starting from Dimitri. Hi, everybody. <coughs> uh, I'm Dimitri uh, Avksentiev, a uh, music composer from uh, Kyiv, Ukraine. I'm making music for movies, uh, some contemporary dance ballads, theater plays, and uh, have my own audiovisual project where I work as sound producer and director. Thanks for having me here. Thank you. Yeah, I'm Elisabeth Ronaldsdottir. I'm a film editor. I work both in Europe and in North America. I'm from Iceland. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Tanel Tum. I'm um, a writer-director from here, from Estonia, Tallinn. And uh, yeah, thank you for having me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My name is Steen Biele, and uh, I'm a Danish writer and script consultant and uh, a lot of other things. <laughs> well, as you could heard, you know, it's a very interesting um, presentation from Jill about the situation, switching from film to television, and how do the creators really feel about it. Perhaps we can reflect a little bit on your respective countries, you know, what is the situation, and expand the, the scope of uh, the switch, if we start. I don't know, shall I give you the floor to you then, Steen? Yeah, well, uh, I asked Edith politely if I could uh, speak a little longer about the Danish situation, which is kind of chaotic at the moment because, and now I'll try to make it short, all the, the creatives within the film industry have gathered together in an organization called Create Denmark. Those are the actors, the, uh, the, the writers, the directors, the, the, uh, well, everybody who's involved in films except for the producers. And this creative, Denmark, has uh, been in negotiations with the Producers Association for five years, and then they finally reached an agreement about what is the future of producing and creating for the streaming platforms. And this was instituted from 1st of January. This marked a sharp departure from the usual way of Renumerating the creatives by giving them a, uh, uh, using the buyout, giving them an amount of money for what you've done, that's it, you'll ever see. The new way they want to do it, in agreement with the Danish producers, is that they will get a yearly remuneration or money for the, the, the use of their material, which is new, and uh, which uh, works on the same model as Flow TV. Uh, the streaming uh, platforms were not happy. The Danish streaming platform TV2, which is state-owned but financed through subscriptions and, and uh, commercials, said we're stopping all development of new uh, series, period. Uh, then Netflix on Friday said we are pulling all productions from Denmark and doing them somewhere else in the other Scandinavian countries or wherever because this is too expensive for us if we have to yearly pay out something uh, to the creatives. Well, on top of this, the Danish government with their supporting political parties 
decided on a new media agreement put in force, uh, in, in force three weeks ago, which said that all streaming platforms operating in Denmark have to take 6% of their turnover and put it into a fund. This fund they can all apply to when they want to produce Danish series or Danish movies or whatever. So it's not a tax that is put into to the, the state economy, but it's put into a fund where they can apply when they want to do productions in Denmark. We expect, and when I say we, it's, uh, I'm a member of the Writers Guild, uh, we expect this to continue, that the other uh, uh, streaming platforms will do the same, that will say we will not produce anymore or develop anything anymore in Denmark. This is of course a catastrophic situation. It will not increase their, their, their budgets, not enormously at least, but uh, we know that we are at the moment front runners in this and the Danish producers support this totally because they don't want to be facility houses, they want to be actual producers. But what's going to happen if they all draw their productions from Denmark? Our hope, of course, can only be that the other European countries will do the same, and so make it unfeasible for them just to move their productions elsewhere. That was just a short, uh, <laughs> I hope it wasn't too confusing, but. Uh, I'll answer any questions if you might have any. Sorry. But are, are you saying that, that the switch hasn't been really smooth in Denmark then? It's been a catastrophe so far. So uh, <laughs> no, smooth is not the word I would use. No. Well, this is clear. <laughs> <laughs> so, Daniel, what is happening in Estonia from creatives' point of view, or creators? You mean uh, yeah, the uh, about the switch to TV or, or yes, that the, what what does you as a director think about the switch? You know, are you happy to do only the films for the rest of your I life? I mean, I guess I would, but but I also I have nothing against uh, good TV. Never never had. It, it's just that we're Estonia is very different. We we cannot talk about the golden age of TV in this country. But you can work somewhere else. Yes, I can, and uh, perhaps I, d I don't know. Hopefully, one day or soon, I, I would, because I would definitely, I would like to try working in TV. But it really depends. So far, there hasn't been a there hasn't been a, a project enticing enough for me to say yes. Or I've been working on feature projects, and and there hasn't been uh, hasn't been like a time-wise uh, possibility to do that. But it's a funny thing that in Estonia it's more, we're talking about like uh, film directors going more into TV than in Estonia there are very, very few film directors that come to mind who have also tried or done a TV series. But there are more TV directors who want to do feature films and and so this is it's it's the other way around because here it's still film is more something more sexy and something more enticing and fascinating than the 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 current state of TV in Estonia so it's it's uh, yeah but it's 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 but shall we keep it this way, or do you think we should move to the TV production? Here? I mean, of, of course we. I mean, it's not. The, it's 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 not. It's not such an easy question because it, Estonia is so small. It's like who? I don't believe that there will be Netflix production being shot in Estonia in Estonian. I mean, we're not like if you thinking of yes, there are loads of Netflix movies like in Spanish, in German, but but we cannot. It mm. would be a bit weird to think that they would. Uh, I don't. I don't believe that it's it's um, that that they would come and and, and hell yeah, let's let's do. Uh, They'll go there because they can do it in Denmark. <laughs> yeah, all of that. But but the numbers so different that you know. Uh, as many uh, productions are done in their respective countries, so many are actually coming in from, uh, from Netflix. Netflix as a symbol to be mm. produced. So maybe the future is that Netflix will produce some national films here in Estonia. 
and maybe not only films, but TV series. What do you think of that? Well, I would like to see that. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's <laughs> Thank you. But let's move on to Iceland and Elizabeth. Yeah, and you have um, been working for the devil. <laughs> I have, <laughs> every day. I just think it's a double-edged sword because we can't forget that what Netflix produces, Netflix, Netflix owns. So for creators, even producers, directors, whoever it is, writers, you don't own any rights to this material. It's Netflix's. So even if they then spread it all over the world and show it everywhere, which is a great thing, you don't own the rights. And for a creative, I think it's really important to own the rights to your, mm -hmm. hopefully, masterpiece. Mm -hmm. But you won't. They own it. And this is a huge problem. Uh, I'm sure if you have a good idea, Netflix will produce. They will. If they see money in it, they will. And they, they went actually on a really big fishing before COVID, they went on a fishing exhibition where they threw production money to small companies and said, make this TV episode for this much. And this was really bad for small companies that took the bait. They didn't get any more money. They can't sell it anywhere. They have to make it for the money that mm -hmm. uh, Netflix gave them to make it. If there are anything that comes up, if there are reshoots needed, visual effects that get too expensive, there's nothing you can do. It's going to be out of your pocket. You know, so you have it, like you say, it's the devil. I've only worked for that devil once. But I mean, the same is with Marvel. And Marvel is really open about it. They just say, first meeting I had with them, they said, we treat our directors as showrunners. That's their, they can do it. It's their thing. People want to work with them. It's a huge exposure. But you're not going to have a, you know, it's just, there are so many options how you can work as a creative. But I, I think we should concentrate on building really strong film funds. And our, because all those streaming services, they work on algorithm. We can't beat that without education. And I think that's where we have to go. We have to educate. We have to do it in schools. How do you dissect stories, characters? How do you read them to images? If you think about it, our whole world is images. And we don't teach children or even grown-ups to read them. So I think education is the key. But I, I don't think create, creativity is always going to be there. And even with TikTok, there are some of the most astonishing stories out there in a 10-second form that I don't know a director who wouldn't be proud of having <laughs> produced that. So I mean, the creativity is there. Everything is there. But I think we still need to educate and strengthen our own front. Education is the key word, as always, yes. Yeah. But shall we move to Ukraine, then? And, um... Um, yeah, I can <laughs> tell only from my perspective. Like, uh, I have uh, several movies on a streaming platform in Ukraine. It's a local one. And I didn't have any payout for, for at least one work. Because we have this black hole in a, a law of uh, rights. And uh, it's, this is the biggest problem in Ukraine for creativity because you uh, you can't give, you can't give a paid for it, so you have only a one time paid, and that you can't collect any fee. Just in even if you move it on theater on streaming platform, so you just can't. There is no law to control this. But so, what do you think of this uh, film or moving to the uh, TV series production? How it is the situation in Ukraine? Maybe you, you know, I was that kind of director from first topic of your presentation because I was mm -hmm. graduating a film school as a di director of a film institute. And uh, after my first debut, I was just, oh, no, I, I can't do it. Because <laughs> if there is no support from government, if there is no law that supports young uh, 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 directors, young authors, you just switch to, to make some money from some TV stuff, and it's the easiest way to do it. Uh, but now in Ukraine, I see, because we was under a big um, 
uh, uh, under big, um, sorry, I'm trying to find the word, um, damage of Russian TV because all Ukraine was produced a lot of content to Russia. So all authors, all directors was switched to easy money Mm -hmm. and doing this stuff and only after 2014 and especially now we have the super strong movie scene from young directors young creators uh, that is um, like i believe in it so i think uh, the way in ukraine that we will have this like big m renaissance of uh, movies uh, directors and creators not streamings okay but, uh, you know, after everything we, we heard and, you know, the New Deal in Denmark and everything, what do you think if we dream and imagine 10 years from now film d'auteur or showrunners? What do you think? Who are going to be on the market? Would I think uh, it's uh, more, more of a mix that's going to happen because what I think is uh, that we need to strengthen the, 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 the creative side especially now with the streaming platforms, and we need the creatives to, to be able to stand together. Uh, the writers, the directors, the, uh, the actors, whoever. And only then, I think, uh, we will be able to see a more just uh, distribution of, of uh, the income that these uh, people have. I'm not that concerned about showrunners versus uh, directors. Uh, I think that uh, they, I mean, in TV series, it's kind of natural, or has been because of the American model, that uh, you have the writers as the showrunners. Uh, and I think that all young film directors dream to be able to write their own stuff and to do this forever. And they soon find out that, uh, well, it's not that bad to have a writer alongside. Uh, I was, and I'm telling my personal story here, I was a, a writer on a, on a, on a film a first-time director, and uh, I wrote the script. Uh, everybody was apparently happy, but then the director, who had great ambitions, no experience, but great ambitions, uh, rewrote uh, the last third of the film. And it was horrible. And, uh, <laughs> and I decided to, to withdraw my name from the project. It was shot, it came into the cinemas, not many people saw it, but to my great satisfaction, one of the reviews in the newspaper said, I wish there had been a writer. <laughs> <laughs> Case in point. Channel, what do you no, think? I think uh, I'm totally kind of agree that it, it's not, I mean, anyway, perhaps like uh, when you're a student in film school or, or doing is your, your first feature in, in some cases it depends on a, on a person obviously that it's the but otherwise it's whether when you're getting gaining more experience or growing up let's say your intention is to make a good movie not just that no I need to write it myself I need mm -hmm. to have my name three times in the end <laughs> directed <Yeah>. by <laughs> uh, written by and produced by because no one else wants to produce that crap so it's it's <laughs> I think it's, it's, in the end, good stuff wins and, and uh, things die that are meant to die. So it's, it's, I'm, it's not, a, it's a fun, fancy and nice name, a film d'auteur, and, and, but it's, it cannot exist just that we, we, we don't care what's inside of it or is it, is it good or is it bad. It, it cannot, we shouldn't just to try to revive or keep something alive that doesn't have a right to be alive, maybe. I mean, it's, I, I'm not talking about like in, in general, it's, it's just that it's not an ex excuse to produce crap. If you, <laughs> it, it's just that, oh, but it's like, uh, and you're stupid if you don't understand it. But that brings me a bit back to this, this, the first slide that was also that I, I don't, it was interesting what Jill said that, okay, that out of 100 uh, directors, like 47 weren't doing mm -hmm. it. And I think that it's that where, where are they going or the vanishing? I don't fully agree with that, that they're just kind of vanishing or, or I think it's just that there's a reason behind it. There's a, first of all, 
there are lots of directors who do their first pitch and they understand that, okay, this is not for me. Because this is a tough pitch. It's, it's not easy to make pitches. And it's absolutely okay that you only understand you can only say once you've done your first thing. Secondly, it would like every year hundreds of film directors are coming from film schools. So that would be utterly unfair that if just the mere fact that you've done one feature and maybe even a very mediocre one gives you some kind of a golden ticket mm -hmm. to do another one mm. uh, at the same and not not competing for for your chance like with these young uh, uh, hot hungry directors coming from film school so i think it's 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 all in the balance actually and uh, it is a tough world and we it, we shouldn't think that oh i'm a director and and now everyone should carry us on the pillow and just oh do whatever you you want it's not it's never i think it's never been like that and it's it 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 shouldn't yeah we have a lot of jobs in uh, industry so they can go like director institute for example you know since i graduated <laughs> yeah. as a director <laughs> but yes you no, wanted to comment a just short thing if, uh, i was a uh, film commissioner at the danish film institute for for five years and during that time we had a special focus on the second feature film, uh, not only having focus on first-time directors, they had uh, their own f kind of funding, but uh, to have a special uh, uh, interest in helping with the second feature, because everybody knows that the second feature is the most difficult one. The first one isn't, the second one is the most difficult. And so we were having great focus on that and trying to, to encourage filmmakers to be able to do their second, second uh, feature film. And I think that this is kind of a responsibility of the film institutes mm -hmm. to have this focus. And I don't know if you have this in Estonia, but you should if you don't. <laughs> we do. Well, yeah, and also I don't know the gender of this, but uh, we all know women really rarely get to get do their second film. So maybe mm -hmm. half of them just went to sit with the women in different position mm -hmm. and within the film industry. But I also think it's, it's a privilege to direct a movie. It really is. Mm. And it should be. It's the most expensive art form. And we should treat it as such. So we should absolutely make demands and, and make people work for their sta sta status. But uh, regarding the film auteur, I also think, I feel like we're moving away from it a bit. And like, I love what you said. And filmmaking is a collaborative art. Mm. And maybe film auteur is kind of just disappearing with the patriarch. Like, we don't <laughs> need a father. We don't need someone, like, we collaborate. And I, that's what I love the most about movies. But, you know, so i basically saying I agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> Dimitri. Yeah, I, I want to continue Tenno's topic uh, about that we have a lot of other uh, stuff where you can make a directing. I was um, working in, in uh, game development and I was in shock how many directors then have on one project. Director of the battle sense, director of the talking sense, director of the just uh, environment sense. And it was like good, uh, nice directors with good, with big background. And was like, whoa. So it's a big opportunity for, to find your way of direction, not, not in a movie, and mm -hmm. it's okay. Mm -hmm. But what do you think where we will be in 10 years' time, in uh, film auteur or showrunners? It's hard to say. <laughs> <laughs> but where would you like to compose your music to? But the uh, TV series slightly longer work contract, I suppose? Not sure. <laughs> <laughs> you don't. But if we, uh, we, if we talk about right now, and you're all creators, and you work on a contract basis, you know, you're creating for the films or for the TV series, mm, what about the fair pay? Do you think you can freely negotiate your contra contracts these days, or are you just signing the contract that is put in front of you without any, not too much negotiations, or are you happy with the workload that you have versus the pay you get? 
No. If I may ask. <laughs> of course not. <laughs> what a question. So what is, the, what is the problem? Why can't you negotiate no. then? Well, uh, I mean, negotiations, of course, are possible. And uh, we have uh, uh, strong organizations in Denmark, and, and they have lawyers that help you with the negotiations. And they also s at some point say, no, you cannot sign this contract. Of course, you can still do it, but then you would probably get thrown out of your, your, the Writers Guild or whatever. But uh, no, I think uh, negotiation is possible with the Danish producers. The difficulty comes, as I said uh, in the beginning, when you're negotiating uh, for a film to be produced with a streaming platform or, or a series. That's when the, the shit hits the fan, sorry. But, uh, and, and so at the moment, uh, uh, I don't know if, if uh, Danish writers, directors are going to to move their work to, to the other Scandinavian countries and do the series here, there. There's a great tradition of Danish uh, writers and directors working in, especially in Sweden and, and uh, some of them in Denmark, and this will probably continue, but at the moment the situation is too chaotic to be able to say. Hmm. What about you, Tanel? Can you negotiate your contracts? Uh, yes, I think I can. I mean, it, it's, 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 uh, although I don't like that, obviously, <laughs> it's good for, uh, that's the thing with directors, that we are, we want to direct the film, we want to do this <laughs> great part, and it's very difficult, uh, very often for us, uh, all this negotiation, and also because we don't know enough. Now that's been, like in Estonia at least, uh, that's started to change, as like your first Part of the question was that, are you happy with your salary? Yes, of course, no. <laughs> Who is the, even if we would be like, would we say yes? Never, never. never. <laughs> I mean, but uh, so it's, uh, and it's starting to change. And the more you know about, uh, about uh, contracts, and then we've been like, for example, lately, we've been very much relying or taking as a basis the fair as, uh, instructions for, like guidelines for director's contracts and um, and that's been a very eye-opening I think for Estonian Estonian directors and and uh, and yeah so you can uh, negotiate if you know what you're mm -hmm. negotiating about but hopefully mm -hmm. also I mean I for example also have an agent so thank God that they are doing a lot mm -hmm. of that stuff mm -hmm. and and also I'm I mean I think there's two main ways to go that it's it's uh, we've understood that yes no one is actually fighting for you you have to fight for yourself mm -hmm. but in order to do that you need you need to have some education you need to know know about uh, moral rights, uh, economic rights, mm -hmm. um, uh, that, that, that there are different rights, types of rights, and when should you give uh, what away and what you should never give away and for how long. And these, these things that, these, these are very uninteresting things for a director, <laughs> but you need to know that in order to get the fair pay in the end or know about like, uh, profit uh, once the film comes out. I mean, there are loads of, directors who don't know to ask that. Mm -hmm. and, and if you're a producer, I guess most producers, if the director is so stupid and not asking for it, then <laughs> not gonna put it in the contract. So. so you are recommending for the director to have first degree in law? No, not first degree in law, but just read this 17 page uh, Ferra's mm -hmm. guidelines for director's uh, contract. I mean, that's, that's a good start already. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, but, but still my main, <laughs> main suggestion for a director that this, this is one way to go. The, the, the second way to go also, which I suggest anyway, would be choose very carefully who you're working with. And I'm, <laughs> I'm not good with numbers, so I'm, definitely going with the latter version that I'm very handpicking or choose, choosing the producer who mm. I really trust and so I don't have these mm. problems. Very important word, trust. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But Elizabeth, you have Yeah, I have to both compare. sides. <laughs> and um, it's hard in Iceland, it's hard. It's a hard, it's such a small market, so we're talking really small money. So no, you're not gonna 
negotiate much. You can try to push it maybe a little bit, but no. It's just such limited mm. uh, money. But the, in the States, just the sky is your limit. Mm. Just, it's ridiculous, actually. How and much is it then? The limit then? Yeah. How much was it, the limit then? <laughs> <laughs> it's just like... <laughs> I'm guessing... I, but then again, I mean, film industry is always just a part of society so it also depends on if you're a man or, or a woman mm. we have to face it so i'm not mm. getting as much as the men but i'm almost there oh. mm -hmm. stepping my way oh. <laughs> <laughs> but when you did sign the contract for netflix for example and again netflix as a symbol uh, did you use some lawyer's help or did you just uh, oh i have an agent they uh, yeah. mm. a huge agency with lots of lawyers but you don't sign with Netflix, and this is what I'm trying to yes. tell you. Buyout. You sign with a production company that has made a deal with Netflix. So, for example, if that production company goes under, Netflix has no legal responsibility. Mm -hmm. So they sign up with a production company, they give them a certain amount of money, mm -hmm. and then they have to make it. Um, so, no, I never signed up with Net. I've done twice work for them, and it was always with different uh, companies. But, I mean, I could talk all day about the difference <laughs> of film and TV, and mm -hmm. the, because you have to understand, film is the cherry. Because you have so much more creative freedom doing a movie than doing a TV. TV, on the other hand, is also exciting because it's a slow burner where you can have more time in creating a character and developing the story, etc. But as, for example, a director on TV or an editor, you don't follow through. Uh, I worked on pilots, which gives you more time. They give you more time to edit the pilot, and I follow through through sound design, through music, uh, through DI. After that, it's just like a pilot in two weeks, uh, sorry, an episode in two weeks. People don't have time to do anything. So you just edit and then it's gone. And you don't know what's going to happen with mm. stuff that's really important to me as an editor. Mm -hmm. You don't know. And directors come and go. They come, direct everyone, and you never see them again. They, some of them never see the episode they directed mm -hmm. unless they turn on Netflix, you know, <laughs> and see it at some point. So I'm just saying it's a completely different culture. I'm not saying one is wrong and one, one, one is right. I'm just saying it's different. But it can take up to 10 years, even more, to develop and produce and direct a movie mm -hmm. and get it into the cinema. And I know so many good people out there, they survive on TV. And they do it because it's money. And I'm just going to say, if you can make one great movie a year and have to do 20 TV episodes to survive through it, do it. Mm -hmm. Like, I think it's great. It's mm -hmm. like a piggy bank. Like, go. It's like commercials. And a lot of that directors probably left for commercials. Mm -hmm. Much more money, not as stressful. It's shorter, better coffee. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> I've seen people disappear there just because we're all human and just the job security is so much greater. But no, but you, and you work not only in Ukraine, but also abroad in Europe. So what do you think about them? Uh, I can tell about Ukraine that we have a really, uh, we have a market price. You can be hired because uh, Mm, it's very limited, uh, like mm -hmm. in your story, it's really limited mm -hmm. and uh, the industry is super uh, small. So yes, yeah, the only way, like I do, it's because I have my own like artist stuff. That's why it's kind of a privilege to take me to a project because I have a kind of big name in music industry. That's why I can do this uh, negotiation stuff. But in general, you, ju you just can't. You have this and and you can get more mm -hmm. and and as as i said already you you didn't g uh, get uh, all this uh, fees for screening you, ju you just can't but what well, let's go we still continue the same subject but what is your ideal uh, model for keeping the uh, author's rights and re remuneration you know what is what would you like to have uh, in the bigger perspective 
I just want uh, want to have what I deserve. I mean, <laughs> uh, this because of law as laws, as I say, I just want to get uh, my amount of fees for each screening, for each. Uh, um, I mean, yeah. So this is a perfect for myself. Model for know. you, for yeah, you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Do you have a perfect model to? Your rights, how do you uh, keep I mean, it? sorry, in music industry, yes. we, we have this way because you, uh, each appearance, uh, you get paid for each appearance, whatever it, it, it will it's be. It's the same so in film. Yes, that's why I, mm -hmm. I, I want yeah, to do it that way. Sorry. Is no, I'm sorry. <gasps> but what was the question? Sorry. Well, this is, uh, what, is, uh, what is your ideal uh, model? You know, if there is, right now we have these changes in the copyright law and, you know, we talk a lot about keeping the rights and what conditions we should have for creators to keep the rights. And uh, I don't know how much you are... Uh, you're, no, you yeah, no, I'm extremely... I might not know much, but I'm interested <laughs> in it. But I think, uh, I think the most important thing, and like me and Steen we were talking about this, this is a bigger issue because the film industry is only a reflection of reality. And if you look at what's happening in Russia with Putin, America with Trump, Netflix, it's like we have to start putting the foot down with bullies. And that's what Denmark is doing now, and I think we should support them all the way. I think we should all participate, because of course they can pay 6% tax and pay something back to community and be responsible of the community, they are actually taking money from. But this is not how society works in our capitalistic uh, society. It's just take, 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 and we are the ones to put the foot down and stop it. So I love what Denmark is doing. I'm all for it. So it's not only the issue of the film industry, it's uh, much and not, larger not in the society. Not checking out, just stand our ground. New deal. Daniel. No, I'm, I'm not sure I'm have something much more to add or go m or, or smart enough to go more detail. Mm -hmm. So in the next mm -hmm. panel, there are smarter people than me. Uh, uh, Who are fighting for <laughs> your yeah. rights. <laughs> yeah, fighting for my rights. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. but, but the same, I mean, it's like in general, yes, of course, it's, we want fair pay, but what is it? Mm. That's, that's the thing that it is about, uh, rights. Mm. And, and, and I guess it's, of course, in, uh, with, with music and with, with films, it's much easier to measure it. Okay, that many times it's been shown or that many uh, um, euros uh, people paid in to the cashier, but how do you measure it with mm. streaming platforms? And or, or this, it's, 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 it's going to become so messy that no one would ever want to do no, I these yeah, things. Definitely. It's <laughs> like definitely. Okay, so Steen I, I has already. Yeah, well, I don't agree uh, that it's going to be messy because there are two ways of measuring uh, the way that the streaming platforms uh, earn their money from the work of the creatives. One is to say how many actually stream the series or the film. How many? They will not tell you. This is the, their big secret. Mm. Then you can say, and that's the Danish model, uh, so far at least, <laughs> uh, to say, okay, you have so and so many subscribers, so let's use that as the basis of, of uh, finding out how much money should go back to the creatives. And I think that's a fairly easy model to use. And, and uh, in that way, you uh, will, as you do when the film goes out in the cinemas, I can still get money from the films that I, I wrote uh, 14 years ago. I still get money from those, and that's very welcome, I must say. Uh, but uh, if I would do something for, for, for a streaming platform, I would only get a lump sum, and then never ever, never ever, because I have, as you said, no rights whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, has to change. The creatives need to keep their rights and find a way. It doesn't have to be the Danish way of doing it, mm. definitely not, but some way of guaranteeing that their success also reflects upon the money that goes back into the creatives for their rights. I think these are very wonderful words to end this panel <laughs> and have a break, <laughs> have a coffee break before we start with the second panel. Thank you very much Thank for you. all your input. <laughs> So there is a coffee in the lobby and then we 
reshuffle a little bit and have the second panel. Okay. <coughs> Welcome back. I think we had already a, a wonderful first panel, <coughs> which got us quite acquainted to the reality of this creative sector. And now we are continuing with the second part where we look a little bit into new opportunities and also the new roles of the creative people, which they have and have more and more since the digital revolution. And then, of course, we all know about the recent context of COVID-19 and the pandemic and that a sector who, or people of the sector, namely the creators who had already maybe not the easiest life, um, had an even more difficult time and this is not only in Europe, but I think, of course, worldwide. And <clears throat> what we want to do now with this panel is actually to look in the uninteresting questions. Uh, those who are uh, terribly important, but obviously also very difficult and in a way also a nuisance to people who want to do their job and who feel possibly sometimes a little bit challenged by the framework in which they have to do that. So a couple of questions that we have and that we wish to raise are what is the legal framework or what kind of measures and legal framework would be needed to improve working conditions of cultural and uh, creative workers, but also how could we encourage creativity for example, if we were to re reward the creators more, we are talking about, are you happy with your salaries? Well, what would, would make them happy? How could they get to this stage? Um, all in view of having them participate in their own success, for example. But also, and that has been already mentioned in many ways, we have to look at really serious legal issues, at copyright law and especially the new copyright directive, what are potential effects? And uh, will actually the copyright directive, once it's fully transposed, really improve the bargaining power of creators, for example? Now, <clears throat> we are going to look into this with a very distinguished panel. And I'm very happy to um, test now my own memory from the screen. <laughs> so um, next to me is Tin Lamp. Yes. From the chair of Estonian Federation of Actors. And next to him, you find uh, David Kavanagh. He's the executive officer at the Federation of Screenwriters in Europe. So representing some of the people we just talked to in the earlier panel, as does uh, Pauline durand Vialle who is the Chief Executive Officer of the Federation of European Screen Directors, and by the way, also the Chair of the Advisory Committee of the Observatory. And then we have next to her, Lina, now forgive me if I mispronounce, Trishkina Van Hatalu, <laughs> who is the board member of the Estonian Association of Audiovisual Authors, and then um, completing the real setting, and not the virtual one, because we have that too, um, is Ivo Feld, who is a member of the board of, and the producer at Al Film in Estonia. And maybe uh, you will have a very special role to play in this panel. We have um, had some of these, well, uh, polls in the discussions before, so I would be surprised if it weren't to come back. But we have more people, and in this, uh, case we have two people here online. It would be nice if they could be made visible on the screens. Yes. So we have, I start on the right, we have Johannes Studinger, who's the senior executive and head of UNIME with, <coughs> and Uni Europa, which um, is representing the workers' union. So definitely an important player in our discussion. And we have also Burat Ötzken, the general counsel at the European Grouping of Societies of Authors and Composers, Jesak. So very welcome to the two of you. And then you see a lady here who would very much wish to be with us in Tallinn, but couldn't because she had a little accident which impairs her mobility. 
but not her brains. And so we are very happy that she's online. This is Maya Capello, the head of department for legal information. And it's actually Maya who will kick off the discussion with a little presentation. And um, that is a presentation where she will introduce you to the three essentials that we are going to discuss, namely recognition, remuneration, and working conditions. So please, let's have her video. Hello, everybody. Uh -huh. I would like to introduce you to my dear friend, Oscar. He wrote the following. We can forgive a man for making a useful thing as long as he does not admire it. The only excuse for making a useless thing is that one admires it intensely. And then he added, all art is quite useless. I'm not certain that all creators will agree with Oscar's stance that all art is quite useless. However, I'm pretty sure that they will side with him in believing that artistic creation goes beyond the making of a useful thing. It requires certainly an admiration for the art form in question and a drive, even an urge, to create something new and original, be it a painting, a theater play or a film. Of course, we all have in our minds images of what I will call the myth of the tortured, starving artist. And I'm sure everybody will agree that this myth should be or become a thing of the past. For this to happen, there are three essential elements that must be present. Recognition, remuneration and proper working conditions. The question is, how does legislation deal with these three essentials? And is there a need for improvement? Does the law ensure that creators get enough recognition for their work? How are creators remunerated for their work and receive a share of their success? What kind of legal measures would be needed to improve the working conditions of cultural and creative workers? Let's start with recognition. As you are all aware of, copyright law protects authors and other persons, natural and legal, involved in the creative process by providing them with a set of rights for a limited amount of time. This protection starts precisely with the recognition that a person is the author of a protected work or that that person's intervention deserves the award of so-called neighboring rights. In many sectors, it is relatively easy to determine who is the author of a work. In the audiovisual sector, it is a bit more complicated given the number of people involved in the production of a film and their different levels of creative input and decisional power. Also, different legal traditions have brought different solutions, with common law countries like the US, for example, giving the producer a central role, while countries with an author rights tradition, most EU countries, put the author in the limelight. In the EU, this has been settled to a certain extent in Article 2 of the Directive on the Term of Protection of Copyright and Certain Related Rights. According to this directive, the principal director is considered as its author or one of its authors. Other co-authors could be, depending on the country, the author of the screenplay, the author of the dialogue, the composer of the music specifically created for a film, the director of photography, the stage designer, the costume designer, the sound engineer, and the editor. According to the Berne Convention, the author of a work has, among other rights, the so-called moral rights, that is, to claim authorship and to object to certain modifications of the work. These rights are fundamental in securing recognition for the author's work. Why is this relevant? Well, there are many reasons. Claiming authorship is fundamental for maintaining the author's reputation, including fighting against plagiarism. Furthermore, it is a conditio sine qua non for asserting ownership of rights and being able to transfer them and being remunerated for their exercise. Which leads me to the next issue, remuneration. Recognition is great, but as Bob Dylan said, you can't eat applause for breakfast. Even my friend Oscar got paid for his writing. You know what he once said, when I was young, I thought that money was the most important thing in life. 
Now that I'm old, I know that it is. Again, you don't have to agree with him, but it is undeniable that money plays an important part in anybody's life, including a creator's life. Copyright provides for a set of economic rights that give rights holders control over certain acts related to the work or subject matter, so-called exclusive rights, and the right to receive remuneration for the use of the work, the so-called remuneration right. These rights are mostly harmonized at EU level by the directives you can see on the screen. The latest addition to the list is of particular relevance for our discussion today, the Directive on Copyright and Related Rights in the Digital Single Market. Among other issues, this directive contains a set of new measures to strengthen the position of authors and performers, including a principle of appropriate and proportionate remuneration, a transparency obligation concerning the exploitation of their works and performances, a contract adjustment mechanism to allow them to obtain a fair share when the remuneration originally agreed becomes disproportionately low compared to the success of their work or performance, a mechanism for the revocation of rights when their works are not being exploited, and a dispute resolution procedure. How good this system is will be surely an important part of the ensuing panel discussion. Coming back to my dear friend Oscar, money may be the most important thing in life, but is certainly not the only one. What is the point of getting money and awards if it is at the expense of your private life and or physical and mental health? Obviously, if we are to talk about working conditions, we have to go beyond copyright and enter the realm of labor law and social security. Because all creators involved in the production of a film or audiovisual work are workers, be it under a labor contract or as freelancers, and they have a set of rights and needs. The European Audiovisual Observatory has not done any extensive research on this topic so far. Nevertheless, we have noticed that there are signs coming from Brussels that point at the need for improvement in this field. In October 2021, a European Parliament resolution called on the European Commission to propose a European status of the artist, setting out a common framework for working conditions and minimum standards common to all EU countries through the adoption or application of a number of coherent and comprehensive guidelines with respect to, among others, the following. Contracts, means of collective representation and management, social security, sickness and unemployment insurance, pension schemes, direct and indirect taxation, non-tariff barriers and information asymmetries. The resolution also called on the Commission to map the existing definitions of artists and cultural workers across the Member States, with a view to developing a common understanding to be reflected in EU policy making and cultural statistics. Furthermore, it called on the Member States to ensure full access to social protection for artists and cultural workers, regardless of their employment status, including access to unemployment allowance, health care and pensions. Moreover, the resolution urged the Member States and the Commission to take specific measures for the different categories of creative professions in order to tackle unstable income, unpaid work and job insecurity and safeguard a minimum standard for their income. In March 2022, the Commission welcomed the Parliament's resolution and with regard to the common framework for a European statute of the artist, the Commission expressed their need to reflect what can reasonably be done. I guess we will have to stay tuned to see what happens next. This was just a very short introduction to the many topics of today's conference. Now, by way of a conclusion, I would like to leave here a list of issues that may be picked up by the ensuing panel. The importance of the recognition as author and as worker. The difference between music authors and audiovisual authors as to the relevance of CMOs and alternatives to royalties. The impact of national traditions on how social matters are dealt with, since this is a matter where the EU has no exclusive competence. The importance of an adequate culture for making the rules effective. And the relevance of unions for collective bargaining and fair negotiations. Thank you.
<laughs> so why the panelists try to find their seats back, uh, I want just to tell you that yes, the video and also the PowerPoint of Gilles will be available on the observatory's website. So if you have an interest, you'll find it there. And if you want to involve Maya further in this event, use the chat box because she is going to be my help in the online world. And with this, let's turn to the discussion. And um, I think one of the most prominent things that is to be discussed is the copyright directive. And the question is simply if that will actually improve the situ situation of artists and creators. And maybe to test our online world, uh, let's start with the unions, because this was also mentioned um, quite strongly that the role in Maya's presentation. So Johannes, what's your take on the role and the effects of the copyright directive? Uh, thank you, Suzanne. I hear, I hear the echoes, but that's okay. We don't hear the echo, so you can just uh, try to uh, <laughs> overcome your own echo and we'll be fine. <laughs> that, that's, that's quite all right. Uh, so thanks for having me and my apologies for not being with you in, in Tallinn. Uh, I'm real though virtual. Um, yeah, the question whether the copyright directive will improve the situation of uh, artists and uh, creators or authors and performers is, um, is a difficult one. Um, it certainly will not automatically improve the situation, um, but it is an enabler that will help um, the community of creators to act uh, on the provisions. Um, I want to make uh, three or four points. The first one is the recognition of the situation, because the text of the directive does recognize that authors and performers tend to be in a weak position when they are negotiating the transfer of rights um, uh, for remuneration. I'm speaking in particular regarding the audiovisual sector where it's, um, uh, the, the rights are usually bundled by the producer and gives the producer the, 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 the function to exploit, to exploit the work and every individual author, co-author and performer is in a very weak position towards the producer or those commissioning behind the producer. And it's very important that the directive acknowledges that and build on its provisions on the recognition of that big position. The second point I wanted to make is that the uh, directive um, recognizes collective bargaining as a means to achieve appropriate and proportionate remuneration. And I think that's where the enabler uh, dimension of the directive is anchored. The fact that there is a transparency obligation, a dispute settlement provision, uh, and before that a, a readjustment mechanism, if that would be exploited only individually, there would be very rare op occasions uh, where an individual author or performer would actually get to an adjusted contract. However, if collectively uh, authors and performance through guilds, associations and unions can act together in negotiations collectively with producers, with broadcasters, with streamers to set minimum uh, remunerations for the exploitation of their work, uh, then A, you can avoid the disputes and also you can um, ensure a fair minimum for everyone, whether you're successful, very successful or very, very successful. Um, the, the third point I wanted to make is that uh, the, direct, uh, the directive and, um, <clears throat> and the provisions can only do so much. Law only can do so much. It really depends on whether collective bargaining will be promoted uh, in the member states and by the EU. Um, and since uh, authors and performers have been traditionally in a weak position and also have been facing barriers to collectively bargain. And I'm sure my colleagues will talk to that issue, so I won't go into details, but there are barriers to collective bargaining in particular for authors performance in the EU. 
this directive can only do so much. So what member states and the commission can do, but also film funds, is to promote collective bargaining based on those provisions. As the directive foresees mechanism for uh, collective bargaining, those must be promoted. And, and, and the last point uh, I, I wanted uh, uh, to make is that uh, there can also, a, a little bit more than promotion, there can also be enforcement, meaning that why should taxpayers' money through film funds go to productions that do not pay and remunerate their creators, authors, and performers in a just way? It could be made a condition. Of course, that's a stick, but it would uh, not only promote collective bargaining, it could also help those guilds and unions that are weak to actually bring producers to the table. Um, and in that way, there is a lot of can and maybes, um, but definitely the copyright directive gives a basis on which authors and performers can work collectively. However, my view is that we need the support from member states and organizations like film funds to help us build capacity for unions, guilds, association at national level, and to promote collective bargaining, not against producers, but with producers. That's my first thought, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Johannes. So we have already heard recognition, collective bargaining, and maybe more. Pauline, what is your favorite aspect? Or what is the favorite aspect of directors should be when you look at the directive? said a lot already. Um, so in order not to repeat and maybe just target a couple of points, um, one thing that is really for us critically important in the, in the directive is that it's, it approaches the situation of authors and performers from a sort of a market regulation standpoint. Uh, it seeks to rebalance relationships that are systematically unbalanced within the, uh, the value chain. And for us in the audiovisual sector, that's fairly critical. So uh, we are very encouraged, let's say, by the fact that this is something which is really at the heart of uh, the provisions that touch to, uh, to authors' rights uh, directly in, uh, in the directive. Now that's being said, there is m my favorite part of it is the transparency obligation, because it doesn't necessarily lead uh, immediately to money, and in that sense it can be a little bit um, you know, less attractive. But with the transparency obligation properly implemented, um, we know what we're negotiating. And with the transparency obligation, we have an argument to go to, let's say, new players uh, in this industry and to talk about how they value um, the uh, exploitation of the work and what solutions they found and what calculations they make. And I'm looking at our colleague who spoke <laughs> from Denmark on the first panel. Uh, the transparency obligation, once properly implemented in all national laws, will definitely be a, a, a very important tool to let's say, allow for this discussion to happen. That being said, um, you know, individual rights are great, but they are paper rights until you can properly enforce them both individually and collectively. And everything that Johannes mentioned on the collective muscle needed, uh, whatever the format of these collective mechanisms may be, is, is the absolute must in order to mm. see this directive have uh, effective consequences in real life for authors and performers um, across Europe. And maybe my final point would be that today is um, the 7th of June, and it's the anniversary of the deadline of the implementation of the directive, <laughs> which was last year. So um, it's also a date which is important for the transparency obligation, because in the directive, this is the date by which all contracts should have the transparency obligation included in. Yeah. Um, so. It's an important date because it shows us two things. First, we're not there on the transposition process, meaning that we have a lot of policymakers out there who need to just 
move it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm sorry, I know it's a bit blunt, but uh, you know, we all went through COVID and uh, we all went through sea changes in this industry and we need this implementation to be finalized as soon as possible. <laughs> so we're very happy to see the European Commission trying to, uh, let's say, uh, motivate member states to, to fall in um, and accelerate the process because this, this really cannot be any, uh, any more late for the oh. benefit of our communities. Mm. Well, I was acutely aware of two anniversaries, that of the Film Institute and of the observatory. That's a particularly interesting one, and I'm proud that go. we planned that well <laughs> <laughs> with the conference of today. Uh, staying with, with uh, what was said and, and uh, transparency and really the making also collective bargaining work, would this also help the actors? What would you say, Tim? Uh, I'd say that it really helps the actors, uh, as we are in Estonia at the moment. So in Estonian copyright law, uh, the transparency obligation <coughs> and the uh, right, the Article uh, 20, the right to change the... Um, so Articles 19, 18 and 20 all came into effect today. So it's a really big uh, leap forward. And I, uh, and I really hope that this will help actually uh, actors negotiate uh, on fair, appropriate, fair and, and appropriate remuneration uh, with the producers. So, um, uh, just to get a, a bit of a broader view, uh, most Central and Eastern Europe European, Central and Eastern European uh, um, uh, countries, uh, actors, representative organisations, uh, are still well. They the. Uh, the collective bargaining is not as popular, probably because of the uh, uh, Soviet occupation past. Mm -hmm. um, and this is something that uh, definitely needs to be improved. Uh, um, and I strongly support um, uh, so Johannes' uh, idea that uh, uh, where... Um, uh, so collective bargaining should be uh, implemented or uh, reinforced uh, on a EU level. Uh, namely by uh, granting these uh, public funds or public rec procurement for productions uh, uh, and uh, making uh, uh, um, a condition in those uh, contracts uh, to ensure that performers are, uh, will be remunerated, performers and authors, mm -hmm. so rights holders, are fairly and appropriately remunerated. And hopefully we will be able to, uh, in Estonia, also negotiate these terms uh, with the producers uh, mm, uh, so, and that we won't have too many uh, legal cases, <laughs> so, yeah, with, impl with the implementation of the directive. Mm. Well, I still don't look to you, Ivo, but you keep collecting all the <laughs> thoughts of what should be done. But uh, let's stay a little bit uh, in Estonia. And uh, Lina, what do what you say for the audiovisual authors and is there a specific situation in Estonia as to the collective bargaining? Yes, yeah, so maybe uh, first of all I should um, make a little bit clearer uh, who am I representing here today. <laughs> uh, I, um, I have two roles. Uh, one is uh, the organization you mentioned, which is the which is a CMO, um, uh, the Estonian Association of Audiovisual Authors. But I'm also a founding member and a board member of the Estonian Directors Guild. Yeah. And, um, and with uh, <laughs> that part of my job, uh, we have yeah. done, uh, cooperated with uh, Pauline. And, um, and uh, I think... Um, I don't want to repeat <laughs> what everybody has said, but also for me, um, as the member of the um, Estonian Directors Guild and as a <laughs> director myself, uh, I see the importance of collecting bargaining. Um, it's, uh, it's very, very important because I really don't see how a single author, whether uh, it be a director, writer, or somebody else can uh, effectively bargain um, uh, upon rights. Uh, I think uh, to be a director, you don't necessarily need to be, <laughs> as Edith said before, to have a degree in law. Uh, it doesn't uh, necessarily, um, to be a good director or writer, you don't need to be 
a strong uh, negotiator. <laughs> and uh, uh, so collective bargaining is extremely important. And uh, I think at the moment, what comes to Estonia, this is something we don't have at all. And, um, and as uh, Tun said, uh, probably it is because of our past, because of uh, everything uh, connected to the word collective uh, means evil. <laughs> and not only uh, Netflix is evil, but also collective is evil. Um, and then, yeah, so it, we have like 75 years of forced uh, collectivization and then uh, maybe a little bit more than 20 years of ultra-liberal capitalism, mm. so um, where this um, uh, freedom, contractual freedom is the A, A and O of everything. Uh, and to overcome this situation, um, of course, the, the, all the articles of the directive, uh, they're nice. But at the moment, if there is no supervising uh, body or nobody to f actual, actually see it happen, uh, no, uh, no body for the author to turn to in the, in the act of uh, bargaining, uh, I don't see how it uh, will be implemented in practice. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for this. I'm still collecting a little bit the reactions to the directive and maybe go back to the screen and uh, to Burak in this case. And uh, we haven't heard yet uh, also the, the few from the music part, composers. Uh, what can you say about your hopes of the, the yes. directive. <coughs> Thank you very much for this, Suzanne. Can you hear me well? Yep. <coughs> Perfect. So, um, JSAC, although represents all different types of authors from audiovisual, visual, and music sector, I will speak, as you said today, mainly from the perspective of the um, authors and composers working in the screen sector and then their issues relating to remuneration. So um, before starting with the corporate directive, I think it's important to say what the problem is a little bit, because it is the problem of composers working in the audiovisual sector being subject to buyout or so-called work for hire contracts that are course or practices that actually deviate from the continuous remuneration and that it gives only a lump sum. So this uh, existed before as well, but normally the European model of artist right regime and the management of relevant rights in the music sector, typically by collective management organizations, have allowed authors to uh, resist to the uh, such practices or actually when they are imposed, at least minimize its detrimental impact of such practices because they continue to receive royalties when the movies made by the producers are shown on the cinemas or shown on the broadcasters or on pay TV, so each of which were paying royalties continuously. So uh, this was the model where actually in the music sector, CMOs play a crucial role. They are sine qua non, it's always there, and then it ensures in a way the continuous of the creators. But lately, with the growth of non EU based EOD platforms, um, where the platform is both the producer and the entity that the company that shows the movie, where these two functions are merged, that this issue has become more unmanageable and overwhelming, let's say. And they, because they those is buyout contracts through uh, imposing those application of U.S. laws and competence of U.S. courts in their contracts. So despite the affiliation with the collective management organization, despite the provisions in the national and EU law to discourage such practices, they were still able to do that by relying on the uh, U.S.-based uh, contracts 
where buyouts and work for hire is allowed. So buyout gives all the rights to compose, all the rights to producer, and work for hire actually makes the producer itself the sole owner. So it actually cuts the connection of the author with his or her work, totally against the very principle of European artist right regime. Buhak, um, so, if you move a little less, the sound quality might be a bit better. There is a little echo or something strange. <laughs> Sorry. Sure. <to> <laughs> Sorry about that. So, um, if the uh, EU law said that appropriate and continuous remuneration is an international mandatory rule in the form of a public order that cannot be circumvented through choice of law or uh, competence of courts, then this would actually not happen. Or when it happens, that those who are imposing that and avoiding fair remuneration could be caught in Europe based on EU law and with the competence of the EU courts. So this is happening because the EU law right now is not strong enough to totally tackle these issues. So copyright directive provides a lot of useful elements and it is building a very foundation of appropriate and proportionate remuneration. And it is the first time that EU law introduces uh, copyright contract rules, which is a novelty, which is a very good development. Uh, the good news is that uh, member states can go beyond what is provided in the directive and then, as Johanna said as well, can take the measures through existing or newly created schemes to ensure the fair remuneration is really taking place. So there are, for instance, uh, for the music authors in the uh, script sector, the French implementation is quite good because it precisely says that you cannot circumvent this principle through choice of law and the choice of courts, and the French courts would be uh, competent to take the cases. Um, maybe so I can. There is a, yeah. Maybe I, uh, we we can uh, leave it there with the example sure. illustrating from uh, from France, where you just to summarize it a, a little bit. Sorry, because the sound quality maybe made it a bit harder to understand. Um, so there is a, a new emphasis in the EU law. It might not be enough yet, but it's a good first um, start on which countries in their transposition could build to come up with, with stronger measures, um, as you gave the example of, of France. And um, this actually leads a little bit in the, in the next uh, question and maybe now a little bit shorter after the first round because we have other issues that we want to discuss also, whether it's enough. And I mean, David, um, it was quite interesting in the break, uh, you have witnessed it at least at the end, when uh, the director met its uh, association representative <laughs> <laughs> and uh, both were actually delighted because uh, fair um, uh, papers were mentioned during the first round as uh, basically describing the situation and the rights of, of directors and the director um, was very happy to confirm that it was so important to have this and, and to have something to, to, to show to the people that they're dealing with. So obviously there's a, a lot of things that are only developing and uh, you witnessed not only the scene but you were also part of the production team of the paper that uh, arose uh, the happiness. So what else can be done? <coughs> can, can I take just a minute to go back to first principles? Why, yeah. why is this of interest to us? Why are we discussing this question of, of creators? Uh, to me, one of the fascinating numbers that came out of uh, Gilles' uh, presentation, the background to the presentation, was examining 12,000 feature films, European feature films, over the last five years, six years, and 120,000 episodes of television over the past six years. Um, European citizens watch three hours of television on average a day. Mm -hmm. Th this room knows 
that the attitudes and views of society are changed, are altered by the audience's access to that material. We, th the impact that this material has on our society is to alter what people think, to change how they think, to change what they think about, to change how they think. It's incredibly important. It's incredibly serious. Uh, you were involved, many of you, in regulating this. You understand how important and serious it is. If it's so important, if it's so fundamental, why do we treat the people who make it so incredibly badly? It's, it's an extraordinarily <laughs> stupid thing to do. I mean, I'm trying to cut this as short as I yeah, can, yeah. Suzanne. That's fine. Um, so it, instead of <laughs> quoting a whole pile of examples, um, uh, how, how have we arrived in a situation where we waste talent, the talent that is at the origin, at the source of everything that we do? Um, how can that be logical? How can we arrive in a situation where the vast majority of people who have talent enough to want to dedicate themselves, to try to write, to dedicate themselves, to try to direct, to act, are not allowed to survive in the uh, profession that they choose. It's, it's not just unjust, it's obviously unjust, but the world is full of injustices. It's incredibly stupid and inefficient. It's a real waste. It undermines the, the European capacity to have a credible film and television industry. And, and that, to me, is the reason why this is a really important issue. It's not just a a complex technical discussion about collective bargaining mm. and how does collective bargaining work and the balance between collective management and collective... All of this is interesting and important. But it's interesting and important for a reason. It's because we're trying to tackle a profound and fundamental problem that undermines and weakens European film and television production. Um, I completely agree with Johannes about collective bargaining, but actually I don't think it matters that we call it collective bargaining, which goes a little bit to the, the, the problem that some of the Eastern and Central countries have with the idea of collectivization. Whether it's collective bargaining or whether it's um, joint remuneration agreements in Germany, uh, professional agreements in France, um, or any kind of contract that you sign with the producers or with the broadcasters or with the streamers, mm. it doesn't matter what it's called. The end effect is that it's an acknowledgement that there's a problem about how authors are paid, and the best approach to solving this is to sit with the people who pay and negotiate a sensible and logical agreement with them. And then to come back to the, the, um, to the directive. The directive goes some considerable distance towards facilitating that mm. prospect of, of collective bargaining. Um, it's not perfect. Uh, and as Johanna says, um, it's just a piece of paper until we can actually put it into effect uh, in some profound way. Um, and I think that uh, for the producers, for many of the producers, when you speak to them individually, they don't want to pay. When you speak to them collectively, they understand that they do need to pay. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, as happened in Denmark, um, uh, eventually the producers come to the table and say, yes, the authors, uh, the actors, uh, the composers, the musicians, and the producers actually have something joint to do together here. They have something to do together here which will improve our industry in, in radical ways by allowing, what a mad idea, by allowing that authors can actually live from what they do. Um, and and I, I think there's something, you know, it's, it's not a small issue here, it's a, it's a large, profound, important issue that we really should address. Sorry for going back to the beginning. <laughs> no, I think, <laughs> <laughs> I think the audience proves you're right. <laughs> and uh, I wonder what our lonely producer says. <laughs> That's, of course, a terrible spot to be in. But uh, uh, I mean, don't take any offenses, nothing oh. personal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, what's your, your take on either what was said or if you want to be more neutral, what do you think of the directive? So, so no, of course, you know, first of all, it's, it's the uh, we all think and we all, we, all, we, all, we all all want to have this kind of, you know, healthy environment. Is the, you know, of course, we, because we are producing films, uh, TV, all together, here we are. So I'm kind of really uh, come along with this Danish uh, model at the moment that we, you know, actually we are the same. Uh, I can't really maybe like put us like, like different <coughs> on sides. Of course, we have like slightly different, how to say, um, uh, specification, <laughs> if <laughs> I may say so. Uh, so um, uh, there is one thing that has come to, come to my mind is, is if, if a producer could be also an author, Mm -hmm. This is something what I have been thinking of actually quite often because uh, you know I've been a sound designer in my past and uh, this goes now I think as under the you know at, at least from some some countries it goes under the under authors uh, why film producer shouldn't be this so I don't know this is one question but maybe 
could be discussed at one point. Um, but as for, you know, I come from this small country, Estonia here, and, and all these, um, I mean, uh, all in all, we make like few agreements. And, uh, and, and I personally uh, uh, feel that the agreements we do are like kind of, you know, hopefully fair, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, so, um, I don't know what to say. So it's uh, whatever is the best for the whole thing. Uh, and of course, there is one important uh, <coughs> topic: is how Europe, of course, can be together strong and and competitive towards you know other side of the ocean, so, so to say. So, um, if this unifies and makes us somehow stronger, mm -hmm. I don't know. Let's, <laughs> take, let's take a look. Okay, yes. Hina, yeah, you wanted to come in. I, um, actually, m my experience. Uh, with the director's guild is that um, the actual opposite uh, what you said that if you talk to a producer uh, personally it's uh, you said that uh I'm, I'm thinking of a situation where an individual <coughs> author is sitting with an individual producer yes. then from the perspective of the individual producer the less money that they can pay the better it makes logical sense especially at the beginning of the project when you're at the development phase mm -hmm. and there is very little money. So and the individual producer wants to pay the least possible amount for the, the project that they're working on right this minute. But if you speak with the producers mm -hmm. collectively, they acknowledge this doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. We can't arrive in a situation where everybody is paid so little. Yeah, but um, my experience that, uh, is that um, unlike authors or performers, <coughs> which uh, probably because of the conditions we have had for years, have uh, worked hard to find a common, um, uh, common story, common language, common uh, worries and, uh, and joys, and uh, have organized. Um, I think uh, the, in the field of producing, there are many, many views and, and that, that what make, makes it uh, dif difficult. Uh, my experience is that individually you can, as a whole, you cannot. <laughs> <laughs> so you would contradict David. Yes. Uh -huh. So for, for, for being uh, able to uh, negotiate a whole to a whole, there needs to be a whole. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, <coughs> th at, at least this is my experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, we all feel, you know, feel that we are in the same boat uh, with the authors and performers. <coughs> but uh, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think uh, producers um, don't feel that, uh, that they are all in the same boat. They have very different views of uh, producing. Uh, so uh, I think this uh, what makes it difficult. Yeah, I don't know. So, uh, basically, you know, we all are different. So I, thi mm. I think there are very different directors, very di different authors, so to say, and of course, very different producers as well. Mm. So, but this is actually quite, uh, how to say, a remarkable <coughs> fact. <laughs> but would it then not be helpful if actually on the EU, EU level there was even a clearer framework? Uh, that might then fit for the various constellations and you pick the constellation uh, which is yours, either individual versus individual or if you do uh, group negotiations then you, you look at this level, would that not be then the maybe driving force and of help? I, I think that one of the <coughs> subtleties, I'm speaking too much, I'll stop after this one. Um, <laughs> I think that one of the, the subtleties, one of the great subtleties of the way the European Union works is it takes them a very long time to consult everybody, and they consult everybody. And after a very long time, they arrive at a situation where everybody is equally unhappy. <laughs> and, then, and then that's the deal. And then it stops there, and that becomes the... And, and that's the same in many respects with, uh, with this um, aspect of the copyright directive, that in a lot of instances, <coughs> they, have, they have pulled back from detailing how it should be implemented. Um, and, and a great deal of work by a lot of people, including mm. some of the people on the screen there, persuaded the Commission that a logical way to do this was to say, we, we established, for example, in Article 19, the principle of transparency. There must be transparency, information must be supplied. But exactly how this is going to work in detail, we leave A to the member states and B to the players. 
by referring to collective bargaining and leaving us to do the collective bargaining. And then what has happened, which is slightly problematic, is because of COVID, the transposition of the directive into national law, it's so far happened in 11 countries, if I remember correctly, in a, in a number of those countries, not France and Germany, but in a number of those countries, it's been cut and paste. So they haven't had the time to get into the details of how the many subtleties um, should actually be implemented. So in a sense, they put even more uh, pressure on us to do the negotiations to how it should uh, operate uh, in detail. And, and I, I, I don't see that there is, that um, with the exception of France, which is France is French, and it's always different from everybody else, um, uh, <laughs> that, there's going to, that there's going to be a much uh, prospect of this making serious progress unless it's done by collective bargaining. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I agree with you, the, the producers are split into three or four different camps with actually conflicting opinions, not just different mm -hmm. opinions, mm -hmm. but conflicting opinions about the future of production. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're not available to talk to us or, or available to negotiate. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, we also have still a, a, another area that I want to touch upon, but I, I, I feel a bit odd now leaving that with, with such a desperate um, <laughs> uh, mood, because um, I do uh, at least suspect that uh, most of you, if not all, are still happy that with regard to the online world and uh, the exploitation there of works, uh, some progress has been made to, to, to flag this up and to show at least some paths that should now be um, followed in, in order to make things better for, for creators. I mean, who would say that's maybe still right? Yes, Briefly? of course. <laughs> no, no, of course, <laughs> of course you're right. I mean, this is, this is progress in, yeah. in, in uh, many <coughs> ways. But I think... The, the most interesting part, in a way, is in what will unfold as a consequence, because these collective <coughs> negotiations, whatever shape they may take, respecting the fact that indeed maybe the production community is not as united in certain countries and that maybe uh, organizing for our communities in certain countries is not that strong at this point in time, what it does is that it forces us to consider what it is that we have to have in common and where we need to respect each other's position. Mm -hmm. For us, David mentioned the fact that um, the issue of being able to develop sustainable careers is essential and is not possible at the moment in a number of uh, areas of Europe. Well, voila, that's, that's a fact. I think for producers, there are a lot of key aspects in the new landscape and the new media landscape and the new commissioning parties that have come up and the, the, their <coughs> own positioning with regards to intellectual property. And in a way, for example, if you take my favorite, the transparency obligation, in the directive, it's clearly set as a right which benefits authors and performers. But in many ways, it also benefits the producers because the liability on the platforms to provide information is absolute and yet it has to be filtered through the production company. So as a producer, you may see this as one, an administrative burden, which is not super great to have on top of everything else, or you can see this as a potential asset for you to also have a better uh, sense of what's going on with the exploitation of your work. And if it leads us as a unit together, the production hub, mm. uh, the creation and production hub, to approach uh, proportionate remuneration and the share of exploitation of the work properly distributed between the rights holders in a more consistent manner. I think that's a massive plus for mm -hmm. the community at large. And in the end, um, if, I think it was mentioned in the previous panels, um, you, you as an author or as a performer, you sign a contract with the producer, but sometimes you assign the rights directly to the commissioning party and not to the producer. That changes things as well. And I think in that particular setup, it is very clear that we have a number of common interests within the mm -hmm. creation slash production hub. And I wonder if we would be so clear and articulate about this issue if we didn't have the copyright directive to start that conversation. Yeah, yeah. I think maybe not. So in that sense, it you is know. helpful. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I think that wraps it up for the time being. It's really, um, I, I feel very sorry. We have a lot of people who have input and it's a very complicated and complex matter. So uh, it's definitely something to pursue and then to have in mind that's now, that was the area where actually the EU has legislative competence. 
But there are other areas where it's much harder for, for, for them to help uh, the creators in Europe. And there we're talking about working conditions, for example. I mean, that's much more scattered. And um, we have also heard that there are a lot of people who are freelancers, self-employed, and then I might add uh, who work part-time and who have really problems to make ends meet, who have unstable, often unpredicted, unpredictable situation, who do not necessarily tap into the social benefit system, and who then uh, got into even more misery when the ben pandemic um, unfolded. And um, I think that was definitely something that highlighted their needs uh, quite clearly to the general public. And there seems to be also a strong consensus on policy level that something needs to be done. And <clears throat> Maya's presentation listed a, a lot of the issues I just wanted to recall. So in addition to the contractual situation and the precarious financial conditions, social security benefits, uh, often there is need for secondary jobs, um, which of course means that they have a hard time to continue to be creative. We have uh, cross-border mobility, we have taxation issues, we have uh, minimum income issues, and then, well, overall, and maybe as a start, we have the problem to what extent um, their various status as authors, creators, um, is protected and, and leads to some sort of minimum right scheme. Now, if we look at all of this, and maybe now not immediately at uh, EU solutions, because they are at least not in a, in a single package, I mean, what kind of policy initiatives could actually improve the working conditions of the artists? And uh, I think, Tin, you haven't spoken for a while. Maybe I give you the floor. Yes. If you want <coughs> to give us ideas. So definitely <coughs> the, uh, uh, the ratification, well, or the, uh, mm, uh, the status of the artist law in Europe in general would make a big difference. For example, in Estonia at the moment we are looking, the Ministry of Culture is uh, redoing the uh, <coughs> status of the artist law in Estonia and they have a, set a very high goal to create the best uh, uh, system for um, uh, freelance artists in, uh, in Europe. So uh, looking forward to it. Uh, but this is definitely, it's um, Again, uh, on what contracts are uh, people hired? Uh, uh, are they uh, self-employed? Are they bogus self-employed? Uh, mm. um, are they paid enough for their work? Uh, do they have social uh, security? Do they have uh, 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 health insurance? These are all like really like critical issues, not only in Estonia, but in Europe as a whole. Uh, and of course, worldwide. So, uh, again, one thing that would um, improve the, uh, uh, the right to remuneration for uh, performers is the worldwide adoption of the Beijing uh, uh, Intellectual, the, world, the WIPO, World Intellectual Property Organization, Beijing Treaty, uh, which grants performers uh, uh, right to remuneration not only in the EU but worldwide. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I just d dozed off there for a while with the theme, but no. yeah, <laughs> um, a bit off topic, sorry. Um, other policy measures, I'm looking around now, there is free raising the hands for short answers. Ah, we're already at this early stage out of ideas. Um. <laughs> No, go ahead. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one slightly <coughs> negative one, you sure? I'm sure I have okay. another one after. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, one slightly <laughs> negative thing, which the Commission is actually uh, a, a roadblock, um, which the Commission has decided to remove, um, is a, a potential conflict for freelancers collectively bargaining <coughs> issues such as mm. these uh, in, in the context of European Union competition law. Now, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, and I have struggled all my life to understand <laughs> copyright issues, which I kind of vaguely do. But to understand competition law as well is a bit challenging. Um, but but um, uh, freelancers are considered, under European Union uh, competition law, to be undertakings. And undertakings are not allowed to get together as a group and fix prices. Um, and you can see the logic of that if you talk to yourself about um, a large group of barristers getting together and deciding to charge vast amounts of money for their legal services. You don't want them to do that. Uh, and so, technically speaking, we have been prevented from collective bargaining for, for ever. 
Um, uh, and recently, the European Commission uh, decided that it wanted to address the question of the European Commission, why do they take a word that we all know and change it into a different word? But they have done that. What we all called freelancers are now called solo self-employed. Right? Okay, but it's the same thing essentially as I understand it. And they're looking at all freelancers, including Uber uh, people, people who deliver food during COVID, uh, all of whom are, are in, in difficult circumstances and, and who would be prevented from collectively bargaining uh, because of um, competition law. Um, the, the Commission will publish, uh, hopefully in the next couple of weeks, but certainly in the next couple of months, uh, a more or less agreed, and we hope it won't be altered, set of guidelines uh, which essentially say that the Commission will not act against any collective bargaining agreement made uh, in, in the, the context of this uh, group of solo self-employed. And it refers particularly to the copyright directive saying that collective bargaining agreements reached under the, the copyright directive will not be challenged by the Commission in respect of competition law. So this is a, a great step freeing up the possibility. But it also frees up the possibility, because collective bargaining is not limited to um, uh, just to uh, the copyright directive. It can also cover issues of remuneration. It can cover many issues of, of uh, social protection um, and, and is a, as an important source to addressing many of the problems that you, that you, you refer to. Mm. The difficulty, of course, is that the Commission doesn't really have, have competence in this area, and it's down to national governments in many respects. And some of those national governments do a good job of this. France does a pretty good job of, of, of protecting Antomedio, in my opinion, at least relative to many other countries. And many other countries do absolutely nothing to help uh, creators, as we discovered during, during COVID. Yeah. So, and, and uh, just to, I think it's important to mention those guidelines. We are now freer to tackle those issues than we were before yeah. as a result of the guidelines. Just happy to Did announce that, that France is actually uh, in the room we have because of our meeting tomorrow of our executive council. The French representative is here and will feel very happy to be uh, rewarded by your applause, I think, for the work they do. Uh, and I think you have a second career as a lawyer. You explained that very well and very <laughs> understandable, maybe better than a lawyer would have. So, uh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> Pauline, yeah. you wanted to add. I, um, I also, th I mean, th there is something that sort of popped up during the, uh, um, during the COVID crisis, which felt really important for our community. Um, we, we know from this, we, we have like factual data, which actually shows from a study we did in 2018, um, that for screenwriters and directors in Europe, uh, there are moments during the production process where unpaid hours are sort of the rule. And usually that's at the very beginning and the very end of, of uh, the contract. So uh, very early stages of development and for us promotion at the end. Now, during the COVID-19 crisis, um, we, we saw a public intervention have a, a new approach to development support. Mm. And that was really, really helpful, I think, uh, for, for some of my people, but also I think for screenwriters, that was definitely something that made a bit of a difference to, to have a more uh, flexible approach to support to development um, and, and uh, maybe have a bit of a right to fail in development as well. Mm -hmm. So having this, this approach that you can actually support um, this, this type of work developing without burdening the producers, for example, uh, all the time, or having a sort of a more flexible approach to early stages of development with public funding, allowing for then things to evolve into a fixed project or then to diverge into something a bit different. I think that was one of the evolution of public support that we saw, which was really helpful and that we do hope will be carried forward in the future. Hmm. Well, that's actually uh, another question that I had noted, whether there is a lack of uh, funding and uh, you sort of already gave a good example where obviously there was and where maybe um, this will change. But is it lack of funding? I don't think so. I think it's, it's not necessarily lack of funding. It's more a certain approach to funding which reflects the realities okay, okay. Of, of what maybe the early stages of so the development of projects are. How it's are. spread rather yeah. than whether it's there. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> I'm just uh, saying I'm looking to Maya and see whether we uh, have more time for discussion or whether we want to bring in also the audience. Hello, can you hear me all? Yes, we do. Mm -hmm. I hear there is an echo, so I will speak slowly. There is only one remark so far 
from the sky, which I'm happy to pass on, and that concerns uh, performers contracts. Uh, they say uh, performer contracts have a couple of pages about what you're going to get and about 50 more pages about what you're not going to get. Very hard for performers to understand then, and when they do, most of them have no clue to even change a comma, unless they are strongly organized and negotiate minimum terms and conditions, including terms of pay for subsequent use. So here I think we, we get uh, really to the ground. So, uh, question is maybe what can be improved in order to help those who are, have less strong uh, shoulders, probably. Well, some of you must have heard this already, that sort of complaint. What would your advice be if they come to you? Well, the best thing would be if you had a strong organization, uh, <laughs> a representative organization, for example, as they have in Denmark or in Sweden, uh, where your rights are managed by the CMO, which is in contact, very uh, co thorough contact with your uh, association or union. So that would be the, the best, uh, best thing. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it is very difficult for a performer as a as a si single entity to uh, hold these negotiations, to understand the contracts, understand the IP rights. So it's really, really difficult. It, it's not practical. A, 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 a serious contract transferring rights would be a minimum of 17 pages long. Mm -hmm. And it's full of detailed, complex terminology. Uh, in, in, in my opinion, um, it's very often the case that the person you're signing the contract with has deliberately made it as obscure as possible. <laughs> um, uh, my my favourite story from my experience uh, in, in Ireland with individual writers in Ireland was the producer uh, sends um, a, a motorcycle round to the house, a motorcycle courier at the house. You come to the door. Uh, here's the contract. I've been told you have to sign it and take it back to the office straight away. Right? <laughs> 18 pages worth. And a lot of, a lot of people will. Because if you think about it from the perspective of an individual writer, an individual director, or an individual performer, you prefer to sign a bad contract than sign no contract at all. And you need insurance when you go on shootings yeah. the next day. Yeah. yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So you, you say, no, 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 I don't, I don't think I should do that. Let, let me just have a read through it. And then you get a phone call from the producer saying, no, no, we have to send it into the Film Institute tomorrow. You must sign it immediately and get it straight back. And it's 18 pages. You absolutely cannot negotiate a copyright contract individually. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's next to impossible. It has to be done by an association, by a, by a CMO, by a guild, by an association. It doesn't matter what it's called. It has to have legal advice and be available and funded to give you legal advice about the contract. Mm -hmm. It's an it's a, it's a Im impossible to solve problem without that, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. it is. Yeah. The guild? <laughs> uh, yes, so I also totally agree in this sense that um, even if we had the money, uh, the, each author would have the money and the resources, I mean, money-wise and time-wise, to go to a lawyer. It's not uh, reasonable uses of resources. Uh, even if uh, there was a, um, some lawyer um, sitting in, let's say, Film Institute, uh, where you, every time a single author has to uh, sign a contract uh, he or she uh, will go there. Uh, it's not <laughs> appropriate uh, uses of resources. Uh, if we can uh, reach uh, some basic agreements from where we start negotiating the individual contracts, we all win. Mm. I just mean enough to ask the producer what would you, what would you recommend? I mean, if uh, it just <coughs> may challenge you on this one. <coughs> Yeah, so, so of course this contractual <laughs> freedom has been like you know around for a while, and of course who who would be against it uh, while we, we being in producer's position? Uh, but healthy environment is really a thing we are looking for, I think. So it's uh, whatever is the best uh, for all of us, I would say. Um, yeah, um, I personally don't feel that we have been like stepping too much on the toes of, of authors, uh, mm. really, but. Um, I mean, does it happen to you that people with whom you want to contract uh, say, look, the contract that you want me to sign is actually pretty long. Uh, can I have more, t more time? Do you um, have that? 
We actually, yeah, first of all, we have had like rather short contracts. <laughs> 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 and, uh, but we, yeah, but I've seen director's contracts being also uh, 30 pages quite mm -hmm. recently. Uh, that was, yeah, like a bigger co-production thing. Mm -hmm. And of course those, yeah, at least it, it requires some time yeah. to review. And model contracts, are you using them or are you spreading them with this? Yeah. No, I mean it's it's it's, it's a bit so so. We we <coughs> we have used different models, and we've been at right now, like recently, mm. uh, trying to maybe find more one common contra contract template. Uh, still, that he's been quite open at the moment, and uh, mm. and it depends mm. really on what we're doing. Also, if it is a documentary, feature film, series. Yeah. Pauline? I actually have a question for you. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it, I think maybe it's also that we've entered times which are uh, <coughs> more complex in mm. that um, some of the things that were fairly straightforward in transfer of rights, in the different type of exploitation rights that we needed to consider in terms of value have generated a lot of contract paper in a way. And Maybe I think that's something which is as complex for producers as it mm. is for authors and yeah. performers in yeah, many right. ways. So is, uh, m my thinking is that in, in a complex world where we have to consider the, the changes in the economy of whatever it is that is being produced and created, um, maybe there, is, there are connection points where actually we can sort of share the pain in a way which feels a little bit more equal than just having individuals mm. like uh, being sort of, ugh, you know, uh, <laughs> <laughs> by, uh, by lengthy contracts, which actually are a consequence of a changing market, which you also feel in many ways. I mean, honestly, for us, it's, it's you know, again, it's a small country <laughs> we, we are working in and we, we've used to be quite precise and short in everything we do. So uh, right now I'm coming through of one uh, rather big international uh, co-production where I've seen the inter-party agreement in between like five parties, I think, which is 169 pages long. Yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah, who on earth could be uh, you know willing to work with these agreements? Uh, and this comes indeed from uh, you know more more from the US, from the UK leg mm. legislation and so on. But I mean, I don't know. Let's be fast and efficient uh, instead of reading long contracts. Of course, why not? Mm -hmm. Well, that's an interesting thought. The cooperation, maybe, to come to common model contracts. Uh, I don't know. Um, I'm looking to Johannes. Is there uh, anything that you have as experience working for the unions in that direction that you could recommend and help out? Sorry, I had to search for the mic. Um, <laughs> you found it. <laughs> yeah, I found it. Yeah, but I'm afraid I don't have the magic bullet. I, I, I think um, that what should be encouraged is harmonization when we stick with the copyright directive at the highest level possible, and that will take time. When it comes to social matters, um, the EU is not really competent though, um, we can inspire, we can be inspired from what the, um, the European Parliament and, and the, uh, the French presidency just achieved this, this week, uh, is to set the EU minimum wage agreement. Uh, it was tough negotiations, but uh, my congratulations to, to the French government for making this possible under the French presidency. So it is possible for employed people at the EU level to reach something that 20 years ago, everyone would have said it's crazy to think about a EU minimum wage. Mm -hmm. And I think Pauline and David will agree with me that we three thought that 10 years ago, in 10 years ago, we thought that if somebody would have told us that we would have a chapter on fair remuneration for authors with those provisions that we have now, we would have said, no way, that is not possible. Um, so the one thing that is really great about the EU is it's, yes, it's very slow, but also it is surprise, surprisingly innovative. And actually, we as um, stakeholders can work together to propose frameworks to the EU that then help us in turn at the national level. 
And I, I agree with David that, that the best thing is to agree on principles that brings the EU a step forward and the industry make them potentially fairer and then leave it to the stakeholders, of course, in conversation and with legal frameworks in the member states to make, make it possible. And I think that is also the question when it comes to fair remuneration, but also on social rights. When it comes to um, whether we can, you know, in a complex uh, world, I, I think uh, uh, multi, multi uh, stakeholder agreements are possible too, between on the one hand, those who work, those who produce and those who commission. Um, and, um, but this, I mean, this takes us, I think, even beyond that conference, how to, to make that possible. But um, I think the encouragement to, to collectively search for, for solutions, that's, that's the way forward. Um, I, I saw Burak, I, I think at least a little bit nodding. Is there something that uh, the, the music uh, sector is maybe even a bit more advanced and can give uh, hope and motivation? <laughs> Um, a bit motivation and a bit uh, cautious, caution, I should say. Um, as I said, the collective management has been the rule for negotiating the remuneration of creators in the music sector. And I think it should remain like that for all authors. And as it is said in this panel and in previous panel, but and also all the collective bargaining or however you call them for the working conditions for the remuneration, very important. But there is also one issue that needs to be added to complete the puzzle is you negotiate them collectively or individually that they are contracts that are subject to rules of the contract law. And we also need, I think all needs that the provisions protecting the creators cannot be circumvented by the uh, non-EU based producers by using the choice of law or choice of court. So you can negotiate the principles of remuneration collectively, but the producer can still impose individually to one creator to give away all its rights. And you need to sue your author in the US in order to ensure that your author gets remuneration which nobody wants to do, obviously. So we need rules to allow to catch the producers in Europe to enforce the fair remuneration, and in addition to all the collective um, schemes that needs to be in place. And obviously that uh, US scenario that you uh, keep painting is also one that is a lot of motivation for the Europeans to really work together like the Danish example uh, and to make sure that you develop a certain power. Um, is there anybody in this room who has a last crucial question? No. Well, <laughs> Lina. I think I, I have a, maybe a different, a little bit different um, uh, ending <laughs> statement. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we have uh, talked now a lot about the, our uh, relationship with the producers, but uh, we have uh, talked uh, quite little, <coughs> maybe for, uh, during the first panel, uh, about the so-called end users, uh, I mean broadcasters, uh, VOD platforms. Um, so uh, when it comes to CMOs, um, I think uh, at least in Estonia, what we are now able to negotiate with the end users, it's ridiculous. Uh, it's too uh, it's too small. Uh, what we get from there, I think. Uh, the end users should um, contribute much more uh, of uh, supporting the industry, supporting the creatives, help them through uh, the, the period from one project to another. Uh, it, uh, sh we shouldn't always look towards the film institutes or the producer, and it, it shouldn't always come from the budgets of the actual films. It has to come from the 
end users. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's a subject we haven't uh, talked about uh, at all today. Uh, and uh, if we now compare to music, for example, then uh, if we compare the royalties mm -hmm. that are gathered in Europe, uh, then 80% of them is uh, for music and only 20 for audiovisual. Mm -hmm. So I would say there <laughs> we have a big job ahead of us. Mm -hmm. Well, there is uh, some, some work of the observatory, at least, uh, looking in the obligations also of, of broadcasters and on-demand services to promote European work. So there are some money flows back on which we have also worked. And uh, indeed, I think this is still a topic to be explored, but uh, you might also agree that these three hours, which are actually up in two minutes, have been very rich and have still not been enough. And um, if I were to draw a conclusion on the, the two panels, can only say I feel that I have really made a journey in a world that is not so obvious. We all see the movies. We rarely ever look behind the screen. And it's important that this is done. And I'm really happy that we have made a first effort today. My guts tell me that was not the last time we did that. I also feel that there is um, really a lack of data in many ways. And uh, there are some people who keep telling that to the observatory. And then usually what we say back, and unfortunately that is the truth, uh, we cannot collect data that do not exist. So that is maybe another plea that we would completely share as observatory um, with the industry and would direct to the decision makers, the legislators, then need to be maybe transparency then not only in um, how successful works were, but uh, also in many other ways of the sector. If this is the case, then we can do a much more profound job also as observatory to bring to the fore many more issues and maybe move the whole thing further. For today, I would like to thank you all, the panelists online and offline, the audience offline and online, the my own um, our co-hosts, co-organizers for their really wonderful work, for the push in this direction. Thanks again, Edit and team. Thank you to the technical uh, people. You have done an excellent job. That was the first time I ever was in a hybrid conference and then in that chair. Thank you for making it so easy. And with this, I wish you a very good day still, and I hope that you maybe visit our website or even visit the observatory. We are based in Strasbourg, and we're very happy to stay in touch with all of you. Thank you. Thank you.